consulting actuary, I probably have some thoughts and comments uh, to maybe provide later. But if uh, it's agreeable, we'll just go with the um, agenda and turn over to you. All right, thank you, Mr. Higgins. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Happy holidays to you if I don't get a chance to wish it to you individually. I just want to take a, a moment here just to introduce a team member of mine who has uh, come along with me today, uh, Darby Carraway, to the back. Uh, Darby's a senior analyst uh, with Kavanaugh McDonald and um, did a lot of the numbers that you're about to see. Um, so she's behind the scenes working uh, diligently. So she's been with us for three years and passing those actual things. So, um, I also wanted to take the time to really thank the staff um, and Mr. Higgins uh, for their tireless efforts throughout this process. This is a team effort to provide all these evaluation reports to you all um, and to get them to you in a timely manner for you all to get a chance to review them. And I think we broke a record this year getting to them to you uh, by the 1st or 2nd of November. So uh, hopefully you all had a chance to review them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know you said I should have worn my Grinch suit, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll keep things light. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, a lot of uh, material to cover here, so I'll get going. Um, I'll just quickly start with the uh, key findings from the valuation perspective. And we, we present all of these uh, reports on a valuation perspective and a projection perspective. And we're going to break down these numbers um, into really good detail, but first off from a, from a 30,000 foot level valuation level. The market value is down, obviously everybody knows that. Uh, negative 8.6 that we saw in the fiscal year, and we do a little bit of a different calculation than maybe your investment folks, um, uh, but we get around about, about negative 8.6 for the year, for the fiscal year. Uh, last year was a different story. We were here a year ago with a lot of different story, but a 32% return. Now the good thing is, actually smooth their returns, right? We've been talking about that for years. So we're not valuing that negative 8.6 all at once. We smooth it and value it over a five-year period, just like we do for the 32% that we received in the prior year. So our actual, actual actuarial value basis, the return was a positive 8.5% above the 7.55%. So that's a great year on a valuation perspective, right, to see we're actually going to be showing you investment gains in this valuation process. But as you're going to see in the projection, what are we doing in the projection? I'm valuing what we know to happen in the future. And we're going to be recognizing this negative 8.6 over the next four years. So our funded ratio really <coughs> flat 61.3, so not bad. Um, but as the projections will show that this number is headed uh, downward. The amortization period uh, using the current FCR of 17.4% is about 48.8 years. So that's saying basically in layman's terms that it's going to take 48.8 years to pay off your mortgage, your debt, the, the pension, the PERS pension plan, you unfunded accrued liability that we talk about all the time. If we were to just continue to pay 17.4% of payroll into the system, along with the employee money and, and the benefit payments going out, it would take about 48.8 years to reach 100% funded and pay off the unfunded accrued liability. Last year was 50.9, so we actually made a little bit of progress for this valuation. <coughs> now, the second calculation I do for you all is a, it's, it's called the actually determined contribution, or the ADEC. That calculation comes out to say we actually need 21.72% of payroll to pay off that debt over a more reasonable period of time, under 30 years. Okay, so that's not being contributed currently, but that's our metric that we calculate for y'all to see how far away does the FCR, or the 17.4, get away from that. And that ratio is 124.8% last this year. Last year was just a little bit lower. So we've actually gotten worse in this perspective. Now from a projection, perspective, we take the valuation results and then we do 30 more valuations into the future until 2052. Okay, here's a look at the short term of where the unfunded liability is heading over the next five years. So it's $20 billion currently. And it's and, it, and if 17.4% is, is, is um, continued to be contributed, 
it's just going to increase from here to about 23 and a half million dollars just over the next five years. Our funded ratio is going to go down from 61.3 to 58.8. Again, these assumptions are deterministic. They assume you're going to get 7.55% returns every year. People are going to die as we expect. Payroll increases are going to be what we expect. People are going to retire when we anticipate uh, hypothetically that they're going to retire. So it's a deterministic. Amortization period gets worse, cash flow is getting worse, and that ADC FCR ratio is getting worse over the next five years. And then we look at the long term projections, and it doesn't get any much better from there. Um, and these are based on the funding policy, your metrics that we've worked with you all very hard over the last uh, few years. But you can see there's a lot of fire engine red here. Um, our funded ratio projection is 48.6%, our cash flow is negative 7.8%. So that tells you that what's going out versus what is coming in on the 17.4, if you divide that by, payroll, by um, the market value of assets at the beginning of the year, it's a negative 7.8% that's going out. So if you get 7.55% return every year, guess what? You still, assets are dropping. You're not getting enough investment earnings to cover that out cash outflow. So let's dig into the results a little bit for PERS. 2022, we had 144,416 actives. Just a little bit of a drop, but it is that continuation of the, of the drop in active membership. Um, active, uh, retirees are growing about a little over 2,000 every year over the last few years. We're now over 114,000. Just a little bit of uh, uh, data, uh, being a data nerd like I am, I like to give you some statistics. Uh, there are 83,000 of those 444 in tier four, so which is 57%. So in 11 years since tier four came about, more than almost 60% of your population is in tier four. So that's gonna help things a little bit in the future. Um, uh, but you know, so we're, see how the turnover happens very quickly in this plan. Um, there are 108 retirees over the age of 100. And there's a, of those, uh, the oldest retiree in this system is 108.6 years. That's the point of 30. So they are definitely an actuarial loss. <laughs> Sorry, my actuarial loss. All right. Um, payroll. Payroll and benefits, we've got about six, almost six and a half billion dollars um, uh, of payroll to those 144 members. That's an average of about $45,000 per person. Uh, benefits are about 33.2 billion going out. Uh, that's again an average benefit of about 28,000 for those members. Here's a look at the assets. You can see just within that last line, uh, 21 to 22, uh, the drop, the, the dotted line is the market value. So we went from $35 billion to just under $31 billion in one year. Um, and then, but however, this is why we smooth, the green line is why we smooth things. Um, that actually did increase uh, by about a billion dollars from last year. So how are we funding? So the liability of all those members we talked about is about $56 billion. So if the account, had $56 billion, there would be no more contributions needed to fund it. We'd have enough money, you know, hopefully the investments would stay level, we'd have enough. But we don't, we only have $31.8 billion to cover. So a little bit um, more than 60%, so about right around 60%. So what's left? So the members are making contributions into the fund, 9%. So that's a present value of about $4 billion there, the dark uh, blue uh, shade. The employer normal cost, or about 1.6% of normal cost of, of payroll is going to cover the employer portion. And then the rest, the green section, is due, is has to come and is being paid back um, to pay back that unfunded accrued liability. Here's just a look at the last six years of the funded ratio. We've pretty much remained relatively flat over this period. Uh, our gain loss analysis uh, looks at uh, what happened during the year versus what we expected. So we expect a 7.55% return on assets 
on the actuarial value, we've got a little bit over eight and a half, so that's why I'm showing that actuarial gain. Um, salary increases, um, active members got some decent salary increases this year, which I know most of you kind of oversee. So no surprise there. Um, that comes with more liability up front, but it actually does help the funding in the future, right? Because if we're making contributions based on payroll, more contributions are expected to come in over the future than what we expected last year. So it actually does help. It hurts in the, in the short term, but helps in the long term by getting salary increases to the fund. Service retirements, I gotta talk about this even though it's $0.2 million. Um, the assumptions nailed it. Nailed the amount of retirements that happened during the year. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing for this big of a system for the retirement assumptions uh, to be this close. I've never seen a number that low on retirement. So that was good. Disabilities is always low. We still are having mortality gains. Um, I think you know another year, 21 to 22, had some of that COVID experience possibly. Um, so there were more deaths um, than we actually anticipated um, happening during the year. Um, withdrawals. Um, hey, before you go, yes, of course. On the mortality, uh, you have shown us in the past where the baby boomers that make up a good portion of the liability, that that mortality table really begins to take off. Yeah, great question. Uh, projections show it's still happening about 2033, 2034 year is when the peak of the number of retirements um, are the baby boomer generation is gone. So about another 11 to 12 years will be our peak and we'll pop. And you're going to see a slide in a second that kind of shows the benefit payments kind of level off. We'll get all those pre Uh, new entrants, uh, just talk a little bit about that. It's not really a loss per se, but uh, a good majority of PERS is teachers, right? We do these vows every June 30th. Teachers get, the school year is kind of in mid, um, summer break then, right? But there's a lot of new teachers that come in in July after this vow. So we typically have a new entrant loss, if you will, of liability because folks, uh, new entrants, they don't come in right at June 30th every year that we make an assumption for. They come in throughout the year. And your group actually has more than almost a full year of service by the time we get the vows. So they've already generated a good amount of liability. Um, but there were uh, 16,000 or something like that new entrants this year. So when you look at $97.7, it's actually only about $4,800 per person. So it's not a, a large number per se as far as liability for this group. Um, and then the other, um, it's broken down into a few other categories. It's kind of the miscellaneous gather everything up. But there's about $47 million of contribution deficiency. This was uh, the second year now that we would calculate the actually determined contribution versus what is coming in. There's a deficit. And it's shown on the GASB statements as well, that it's about $47 million. So that's that contribution deficiency. We're hopeful with our recommendation that we can avoid that going forward. So our allocation of the 17.4 is here, uh, 1.6 for normal costs, the accruing benefits, um, and then the 15, the remainder 15.8. So that is what's going to pay down the unfunded 15.8% of the payroll. So again, that would, if that continues, it would take 48.8 years to pay off that $20 billion. Here's a look at now my calculation as an actuary on the actually determined contribution. And this is the funding policy that we set to set this metric is to say, well, we don't want it to pay over 48 years. We want to pay for it over a, a smaller period of time. So we set the 2018 unfunded of $16.9 billion over a 30-year closed period. We're closing it one year after the next. So it's got 26 years left, and that's, that payment is about $1.2 billion. 
Um, and then since then, we've had four valuations. We've had four years of slight losses, um, actuary losses too. So it has added to that unfunded, and you can see it's now 20.1 billion. It needs about 1.36 billion to pay for this over this uh, schedule, which is about 25 years. Um, it's about 20.12% of the payroll. So when I calculate the ADEC, I take that same normal cost of 1.6% of payroll, add the 20.12, and that's how I develop the 21.72. So again, that ratio is in the red. Let's look at the projections. So I added this slide um, this morning. Uh, as I was preparing, I, I, I just wanted to take a step back and just show you, this is what you're here for. This is what this system is doing uh, for its members. It's paying benefit, retiree benefit payments to your members. And I just want to show you that you're paying out $3 billion of benefit payments to your current retirees, but then there's the next generation of future retirees coming in over the next 30 years. And you can see that this $3 billion isn't going to stay level for very long, but you can see as it gets up to about that 2034, 2035 period, it kind of flattens out. So over the next 15 or so years, we're going to be increasing this to over $5 billion um, that is anticipated to go out of this system. I think that was it's in the monitor, but I don't know if anyone's ever looked at it, but it's pretty powerful to show what, what the anticipation of benefit payments are going on. So again, we run this deterministic projection. These are the numbers. And I've got to put a slide in here of numbers, but this is basically a look at total payroll, what we expect, the unfunded, what we expect, and so forth and so on. Um, but I have it graphed for you, so if you like graphs, we can show it. But just there, the 2047 is the bogey. That's the, the funding policy metric. That's what we're looking at, that funded ratio of 48.6%. Here's it graphically. So here's a look at the unfunded graph, uh, the funded ratio graphically. So that's the red line. It corresponds with the right-hand side of the graph. That's the funded ratio. So you can see we're at 60, 61% now. Um, it stays level for the next three years, and, and then that fourth year, it goes down uh, because of this negative 8.6. Again, it's the, it's the last one left, it's a negative, so it goes down, and then it just, unfortunately, it doesn't recover. Um, the cash flow doesn't recover from it. And you can see the blue bar, the blue por portion of this bar is the assets. And the assets are remaining relatively level. We want to see the asset grow over this time. The liability is the combination of the green and the blue. That is growing. That is growing. It's just the nature of a pension plan where people are being paid more, uh, benefits are higher, um, so liability is growing. Here's a look at the cash flow projection. So again, we're at negative 5%. This shows you getting down to that negative 7.8%. And then it does, it does come back up, but not above where we want it to be. And then this is the look at the projection of the ADC, the ADEC, and the FCR ratio. And this just, if we stay at the 17.4, that's the green line. The ADEC is just going to continue to grow uh, because of the contribution deficiency. So again, this is uh, what you saw earlier, the same um, table with the metrics uh, that the funding policy has. And uh, since all are in red, um, it is the, as part of the funding policy that the actuary should recommend an increase in the FCR. And our recommendation is for an increase uh, from 17.4% of payroll to 22.40 or 5% increase in rates uh, beginning July 1st of 2024. If that is done, starting July 1st of 2024, this is what your new projection would look like. The funded ratio would be up to 86.1. The projected funded ratio, excuse me, would be up to 86.1. The cash flow, the lowest cash flow would get it would be about negative 5.4. And we're currently at negative five, so it really doesn't get much lower than what it is currently. And then it fixes the ADEC FCR ratio 
for next year's valuation, I'm, predict, I'm predicting that the, the ADEC, uh, the, yeah, the ADEC will be the 22.40. It's a little higher than the 21.72, and that's why I'm um, actually recommending something higher um, because I'm anticipating uh, what's going to happen this fiscal year that we're in. So we get that um, that ADEC FCR ratio right back to green status. So it's a lot of information. Um, in a short period of time, I want to pause here and just see. We've got a lot more to go, uh, but I want to get to the other three plans, and then we're going to talk about sensitivity uh, around these numbers and what they could potentially be next year with some adverse or, or better um, um, than, than assumed assumptions. So any, any questions there? I know you've all kind of expected this, but you know, just wanted to see. Yes. This slide, it's the funding ratio So again, we're five, almost six months through this fiscal year. Yeah. And there's a lot of things still to come. Obviously, we were here last year and we were not looking at a bad return at all. So things can happen, like Mr. Hagen said. So there's a lot of what ifs uh, to happen still in the next six months. Yeah. My, my job as an actuary is to just give you the trend lines, right? We don't know what's actually going to happen when people are retired but we can give you the best estimate we can for the next year's valuation based on our assumptions, right? So if you go up to 22.4%, I'm hopeful that in the 23 valuation, when I'm here next year, that we will be all in the green status. We have to get a 7.55% return this year, this fiscal year we're currently in, right? So don't quote me on being in the green next year because we might not get 7.55%. Hopefully we do. Hopefully the, the markets rebound here uh, and we can get that. Am I correct that we're right at zero right now with our assets? We're six months in. It's a little bit positive. Yeah, so that's not a little bit positive. So if, if that continues, then we would we wouldn't be in red.
So is that what is that the does that one get the same way going before that? Does it change a lot whenever that rate is changed instead of getting things going forward? And is it more sensitive than the than the funding ratio in the cases? Yes. It, um, your plan is is very volatile with investment experience. We've seen that. We've got a short thirty percent return where the numbers before Back in 2020, the numbers didn't look good, right? I recommended a, a contribution increase, but then the plan got 30% and said, well, we've just invested our way out of it, right? So we didn't need it. We didn't need the contribution increase then. Um, so, now this year, obviously we've got a negative 8.6. Now remember, the negative 8.6 is not just a negative 8.6, it's we were expecting seven and a half. It's actually a negative 16% loss. That volatility kills this plan's cash flow. Exactly right. And you'll see that in the sensitivity analysis. It just kills it. Because there's actives that have been decreasing. We just don't have enough dollars coming in. And that's why it's such a big recommendation here. And I hate Believe me, I hate to do this, but this is a large increase. I get it, um, and, it's a, and it's a big thing for the state, but this is how much is kind of needed.
also to some extent it's the nature of uh, the traditional defined benefit pension plan where um, you know, that risk is born based upon the system and on the sponsor, in this case the state, so there's that part of it. Um, and, uh, and then also, we, I'll give you risk, I did briefly mention, I know that you may not <laughs> entertain too much, but we've got to keep in mind that the um, recommended assumed rate of return is 7%. Of course, there's a plan in that funding policy to transition down to that, but uh, if you recalculate these numbers at the assumed rate of 7% or even 7.25%, the recommendation of the rate would be high. So uh, uh, I'll just provide a little commentary there. Awesome. How did we come up with it? I don't know if that would be my time most of the time, but how did we come up with the decision to go down to 6 No, it's 7.00. That's the, that's the bottom line we need to go to. That's the point. That's, the, that's my, our recommendation that the board should be at. It's the board should make when they adopted that policy. Policy to have that transitional approach down uh, using future investment returns, excess investment returns, was actually put in place before the 30 something percent. So that was in place, and then the 30 percent happened, and they had that excess return that lowered at 20 basis points, and that went from 7.75 to 7.55. The recommendation is 7, but we only went down to 20 basis points. Yeah, the 7 percent was uh, is based on our review of the during the experience study that we do every two years. So we look at Callan's uh, capital market assumptions, your investment policy, and kind of do some forward-looking modeling and see where the, the seven, uh, where that falls in line with like a 7% assumption going forward. We do look at historical, but we put more weight on the forward-looking because that's, that's where we're headed. We don't want to base on our assumptions on what may have happened in, in, in the past. Investments on so. One other thing, okay, and I, I defer to the chairman and the committee on this, but it seems relevant to some of the topic. I'll say this in my view, part of the reason for some of the things we've talked about, about the, uh, the changes from two yellow you know, shortly after uh, 2018, and some of the same, but any long story short, I think there's been a change in the community over the years. By community, I mean the actuarial community the um, uh, investment community, the public pension community, the bond rating community, all of the above, to put more emphasis on certain things, especially the, the assumed rate of return and amortization. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. In ways, it can be a good thing. It's a more conservative approach to the funding. It's a more conservative approach to the plan. Maybe you know a good thing for a conservative state like this city. But I said that to say this. It puts more pressure on the rate, specifically the ADA uh, metric, because uh, I believe prior to that time frame, basically, like we do now in the valuation, it took the unfunded amount, they had to feel free to jump in here any time, but the unfunded amount was essentially refinanced each year. And we still do that in the report, but for the purposes of the ADEC uh, metric, and when it was created in 2018, the, the funding policy adopted a closed amortization approach, and it, it closed the unfunded as of that time at 30 years, and the later approach going forward at 25, so it went to a Closed amortization, I believe that's what's driving that ADA metric a lot. It's not a bad thing, I think it is what's right. That's exactly right. Yep. We, 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 we added just on the paper $2 billion, if I'm not mistaken, just going from $775 to $765. Didn't change any dollars we had in the bank, didn't change anything else, but it added, which again put pressure on that same metric. So going from when we were at eight. And going back to 1999, when we went to the 3% compounding, there was $3.7 billion added to the liability uh, for all of those that were grandfathered in. So the 
Yeah. So similar results here for the Highway Safety Patrol. Uh, their funded ratio actually went down uh, one percent. Um, they're getting uh, their FCR is forty nine point oh eight percent of payroll, so they're getting a, a good 